Welcome to Live at State, the State Department's online interactive video program for engaging with international media. Uh, we're delighted to welcome guests from all over the world today, and particularly we'd like to give a shout out to our watch parties joining us from our embassies in Rwanda, Ethiopia, Malawi, Ghana, Republic of Congo, Zimbabwe, and Zambia. Uh, we're fortunate to have with us today the Assistant Secretary for the Bureau of African Affairs, uh, the Assistant Secretary Linda Thomas-Greenfield. Uh, she's here to talk to us about U.S. policy in Sub-Sahara Africa. Now, before I turn the time over to Assistant Secretary Thomas-Greenfield, uh, we would like to go through a couple housekeeping items at first. Uh, for the, to start, if you notice at the bottom of your screen, on the bottom right-hand side, you'll see a little box titled, uh, questions for a State Department official. So go ahead and go down now and you can start typing in your questions and we'll get to as many as we possibly can over the next couple minutes. If for any reason you have problems uh, entering the questions or with your system, you can go ahead and send an email to live at state.gov and you can just send your questions there and we'll also uh, get to those as they come in. Uh, if you want to continue with the conversation after this program, you can always follow the State Department on our Twitter feed, which is at statedep. But you can also follow the Bureau of African Affairs uh, at Africa State. And also on top of that, they have a Facebook page and you can follow them on Facebook, which is at you know, facebook.com slash DOS African Affairs. All right, and with that, we'll go ahead and get started. And Assistant Secretary Thomas Greenfield, thank you for joining us today. We'd like to open it up with uh, any opening remarks you may have. Well, thank you very much. I am, I'm really excited to be here. Uh, I have uh, been in the position of Assistant Secretary for African Affairs all of two months. Uh, I'm delighted to be working on Africa issues again, having served uh, for four years as the U.S. Ambassador to Liberia and previously as a Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary in the Africa Bureau. It's really, really exciting uh, to meet the press in Africa. And I think it says a great deal about our policy on free press and encouraging press freedoms. So I look forward to getting to know all of you, talking about issues in Africa, and at some point visiting the countries you're calling in from and meeting you face to face. So again, thank you very much. Thank you so much. Uh, as we get started, we'll start pretty broadly. Uh, how would you define U.S. interests in Africa and how are they changing? Uh, that's a great question. Uh, let me just start by saying that our interest in Africa is in the people of Africa. Every policy initiative that we have taken over the past few years focus on uh, Africa's people. And as we look at the four pillars of our U.S. foreign policy, it's uh, strengthening democratic institutions that, again, focus on people. We want to promote regional peace and security. We want to engage young African leaders like all of you who are, are, are sitting in, in the room, and we want to promote development, trade, and investment. Uh, so those are the core policy pillars, but for those of you uh, who followed the President's visit to, to Africa uh, a few, few months ago, uh, he announced three major initiatives. And again, these are initiatives that focus on, on people. He announced uh, Power Africa, uh, which will look at the possibility of working with some of our uh, African col colleagues to bring electricity to 80% uh, of the population who have never had electricity. He announced Trade Africa, which is an initiative that will look at trade in East Africa to start, how African countries can better trade uh, among themselves, but also to encourage uh, the trade with the United States. And then third, and, and one of the most important initiatives is YALI, uh, the Young Africa Leaders Initiative, which will uh, have us work with young leaders all over the continent. As you know, more than 60% of Africans almost in every country, and this figure might be quivered with a little bit, but about 60% are uh, ages 35 and below. And we really want to focus on helping to build the leadership skills of, of those young people so that they can move into positions of authority in the future. So I look forward to hearing your questions and uh, having this discussion. Thank you very much. Getting us started, we have Bridget Mananavir from the Daily News Zimbabwe. Starts off with a very uh, current affairs issue. Uh, she, said, she asks, how will the U.S. government shutdown affect its policies in Africa, including investment and funding? Uh, that's an excellent question. 
uh, and it's a question that we're getting uh, a lot uh, across the world. Uh, the State Department and USAID are major, major funders on, on the continent of Africa are national security agencies. And because of that, we are able to continue operations, albeit uh, sometimes at, at lower levels as, as we move forward. But most of our funding right now is 2013 funding, and that funding will continue. Uh, we're hoping that this is short-lived and we will be able to move forward, but I think uh, most of you will not see any difference in what we're doing in Africa on uh, the development front or on the investment front. Ajahn Mapanna from the Pan-African Visions, he asks, or he explains, terrorist acts seem to be on the rise in Africa with recent attacks in Kenya and the continuing chaos in Nigeria as a result of Boko Haram. In what concrete ways is the U.S. assisting African countries cope with the threats of terrorism? With all its atrocities, it appears that the U.S. does not consider Boko Haram in Nigeria a terrorist group. It has bombed a United Nations building, killed people in churches and mosques, and most recently, students. What definition of a terrorist group is missing from the activities of Boko Haram, or why is the U.S. reluctant to label it as one? Uh, let me start with, with that question. We do consider Boko Haram a terrorist group. We have sanctioned all uh, the top three leaders of Boko Haram, and we are working very, very closely with the Nigerian government as they address this security threat. We believe that terrorism anywhere affects people everywhere, and we want to be uh, involved in assisting our colleagues, whether it's in Kenya or Somalia or Nigeria, in addressing this threat. I want to offer my condolences to uh, the people of Kenya, uh, following the Westgate uh, terrorist attack. And I want to announce uh, again that in Nigeria, we are horrified by the attack on young people at uh, this college. And we do see that as a terrorist act. And I offer my condolence, condolences to the people of Nigeria as well. Speaking of Westgate, Kevin Kelly, the U.S. U.N. correspondent for the National Media Group in Kenya, asks, how does the Westgate Mall attack affect U.S. relations with President Kenyatta? And will there be a modification of your predecessor's warning of consequences should Kenyatta be, el be elected? And how have those consequences been manifested to date? Well, we, the Westgate uh, event was an event, again, that affected many, many people, not just the Kenyan people. There were nationals from uh, many other countries who uh, were affected by that. As you know, President Obama called President Kenyatta to express our condolences and offer our assistance to the Kenyan people. So we will continue to support the Kenyan people as they deal with terrorism, as they have dealt with the fire at the airport, and as they move forward to uh, provide security for all of their people. Uh, the uh, position of the U.S. government, as I started out at the beginning, we work with the people of Africa, and the people of Kenya are important to uh, to all of our policies. Uh, Scott Stearns from VOA asks, he has two questions on Mali, and he asks, what is your assessment of the new government's control over the military? In his speech at the UN last week, President Kita said that there has to be a regional approach to fighting terrorism in the Sahal because it's bigger than the, any, than the resources of any one country. And how is that going? Uh, thank you for that question. Uh, one of my first trips as Assistant Secretary was to uh, attend the inauguration of President Keita in Mali, and it was really an amazing event. There were 20 heads of state from around uh, Africa, as well as the uh, President of France and uh, the King of Morocco. Uh, all of that says how much we, as an international community, support Mali. Uh, the election, I think, uh, happening 18 months after the coup d'etat, sent a strong message to those who would uh, use coups to overturn governments that that is unacceptable. We are looking forward to working with the government of Mali as the government moves to address many of the issues that resulted uh, from the coup d'etat. And we are very, very, uh, we have made very, very strong statements that the military must be subordinate to civilian leaders. Uh, and we will work with the Mali government to ensure that that's the case in, in Mali as well as in other locations where the military might be looking to uh, do the kinds of things that were done in Mali. 
Moving along to Miriam Kalisa, the Matindi FM, Malawi. And she asks, in terms of conflicts in Africa, how much is the U.S. doing to ensure that people resolve whatever is wrong? Uh, for example, the Lake Raggle uh, between Malawi and Tanzania, the conflicts in Madagascar and others. Uh, that's a good question. Uh, we are actively involved in Africa. And, uh, of course, conflicts in Africa are not uh, beneficial to the people of Africa. One, again, my very first trip as Assistant Secretary was to the Great Lake regions uh, to meet with uh, the government of uh, Rwanda and the government of uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo as tensions were rising in that region. We've been proactively involved in the situation in CAR to ensure that that conflict does not spread, but also to help uh, that country address the issues that have resulted uh, in, in the conflict. We're working very, very closely uh, with uh, the government of, of Somalia to ensure that conflict uh, there does not uh, occur again. So again, I think all of this is to say that we are concerned about conflict. We want to ensure that uh, African countries benefit from prosperity, that they take advantage of the opportunities that are there so that Africa can move uh, smartly into, into the next century. Our next question comes from Rebecca Chimjeka from Joy FM in Malawi. It says, Malawi has not taken a clear position on gay rights and same-sex marriages, which countries like yours have been campaigning, campaigning a lot for. Uh, what is your stance on this and the dilemma that Malawi has found herself in coming from a conservative society background? Uh, that's a great question. The United States believe that all people are cre created equal. I'm an African American. I have gone through the experience of being in a country where there were questions about that. So for us, it is uh, unequivocal that regardless of people's sexual orientation, uh, regardless of uh, their, their gender, we want all people to be treat, uh, treated uh, with uh, all the rights and protections uh, of human rights that we expect all countries. So we are prepared uh, as the United States with very strong values in this area to work with countries in Africa to help them develop uh, the uh, legislation that will provide human rights to all of its people. And in the case of Malawi, uh, we're prepared to work with that government. We're prepared to work with other governments that have issues in, in this area. But I think I can say without, uh, without any doubt uh, that uh, human rights are a core value of the United States, and that plays into all of our uh, relations with every government we're involved in. Uh, Jenny Clover from Reuters Rwanda asks, are you convinced that Rwanda is no longer supporting the M23 rebels? We have uh, had meetings uh, in the region with the uh, government of Rwanda, with the government of DRC. Uh, as you know, uh, Secretary uh, Kerry appointed Senator Feingold uh, to work on conflict in that area. We have made it clear in our discussions that uh, any support of any rebel group, whether it's M23 or uh, L, uh, FDLR, uh, any support of those rebel groups is, is seen as contributing to, to conflict uh, in the region. So we have uh, expressed our views to the government of Rwanda, to the government of DRC, and we're working closely with partners in the region to ensure that groups like M23 are uh, demobilized, disarmed, and held accountable for all actions that they have taken uh, against the civilian population in DRC. As a quick follow-up to that same question, can you confirm reports that the U.S. has stopped military support to Rwanda and some other countries because of their use of child soldiers? Uh, we, under the, uh, uh, the Child Soldiers Protection uh, Act, uh, we have just announced uh, those countries that are being sanctioned under that act, and Rwanda is one of, one of those countries. Our goal is to work with countries who have been listed uh, to ensure that any uh, uh, involvement in child soldiers, any involvement in the recruitment of child soldiers stop. Uh, in this case, it was related to M23, and we will continue to have discussions with the Rwandan government on that issue. Uh, going back to the Daily News Zimbabwe, 
Bridget Mananavir asks, uh, what have what have seen or we have seen nations that had previously imposed targeted restrictions on officials and companies in Zab in, in Zimbabwe in Zimbabwe eased them. Recently, the EU lifted sanctions on government Diamond Body Zimbabwe Mining uh, Development Corporation. What is the U.S. stance on diamond companies, and will it maintain them, and for how long? Uh, I, I'm not sure I know the answer to that question, but I can say to you uh, that in the case of Zimbabwe, our sanctions continue. We will uh, be reviewing those sanctions on a regular basis, and if there are additional individuals uh, who should be sanctioned, we're prepared to add them to our sanction list. And if there are people who we think can be removed from the sanction list, we will remove them from the, uh, from the list. Uh, I will add that uh, we were disappointed with the uh, uh, election. While it was violent free, we're, we're not convinced. It provided an opportunity for all Zimbabweans to express their, uh, their views in, in the election. And again, we will be reviewing our sanctions in, in light of that. Okay. Uh, Isaac Ungiri from the National Media, Nairobi, Kenya, asks, Kenya is in the process of pulling out uh, of the ICC after Parliament passed a motion urging the government to withdraw from the court where the president and his deputy are facing charges. What is the position of the U.S. government regarding this? The, uh, the decision by the government of, of Kenya uh, to pull out of the courts, and we don't know that they uh, have in fact made that decision, doesn't have an impact on the current cases against uh, the president or the, uh, the deputy president. As you know, we are not a signator to uh, the Rome Convention, but we work very, very closely with the member states to ensure that the ICC is able to carry out its responsibilities and, and its duties. Uh, we will look forward to uh, continuing to, to work on, on those issues and uh, hear what African governments have to say about this. But our uh, efforts are to ensure that the court is able to continue to function in a way that allows it to deal with some of the issues that are before the court. Okay. We now have a question from our watch party in, at the U.S. Embassy in Ghana. Um, Edmund Smith from Asante Daily Graphic in Ghana asks, what areas of partnership does the U.S. have with Ghana? Uh, that's a great question. I just, uh, I was in New York uh, last week and I met with, uh, I met with your president. Uh, we have uh, a very, very strong partnership with the government of Ghana. We're very, very uh, pleased with uh, the results of, uh, of the Supreme Court decision. Uh, where Ghana was um, uh, had a free, fair election, and it was confirmed by, by your Senate, and it was accepted by the opposition. I think that says a lot about how far Ghana has come as a democracy and how strong uh, Ghana's democracy is. So again, we look forward to working with uh, Ghana. We have lots of investments in Ghana. Ghana is a recipient of uh, a Millennium Challenge uh, Cooperation uh, Compact. Uh, we, again, uh, encourage the people of Ghana to continue to move forward as a strong democracy and as a model uh, in the continent, on the continent and particularly in the region of West Africa. Uh, we're going to go to another watch party, which is in Abuja. Uh, they ask, corruption is the bane of Nigeria's economic growth. How can the U.S. assist? Uh, that's a great question. And corruption, uh, as I've been quoted saying many times, is, is a cancer. Uh, corruption thwarts a country's ability to, to prosper. And uh, we are working with uh, the Nigerian government, uh, with its justice sector, and other elements to ensure that Nigeria builds the infrastructure and the capacity uh, to deal with issues of, of corruption. I think it goes without saying that Nigeria's uh, prosperity has been affected by by corruption. It's a reputation that uh, Nigeria will have a hard time living down. And uh, we hope that we're able over uh, the next few years to work with the government to ensure that uh, those uh, individuals who are involved in corruption are held accountable uh, in uh, the legal system of uh, Nigeria. Next question comes from Manjakari Sorensa in the AFP Madagascar. How the, how the U.S. did see the election of October 25th in Madagascar? Uh, we are, are, are hopeful 
that this election uh, is uh, one that will allow the uh, uh, Madagascar people to move forward, that the uh, election will allow, the next election will allow all candidates who are eligible uh, to run for president, and that there's a free, fair, uh, transparent election that again, we'll get uh, Madagascar off of uh, the uh, list of countries that have been sanctioned by us and others because of, uh, of uh, the problems that they have had, and Madagascar can start moving forward economically as well as as a democratic and uh, politically stable country. Um, so Faniri uh, Rakatandria asks, how would you involve young sub-Saharan young people in the resolution of conflicts in sub-Saharan countries as they are numerous here? Uh, as I mentioned at the start, the population of youth in Africa is, uh, is significantly high. I won't quote the statistic because uh, it changes uh, depending on who's quoting it. But African youth uh, have been the victims of conflict uh, all over Africa. Uh, they have been uh, victims of recruiting, uh, they have been uh, victims of violence, and we want to see uh, young Africans also uh, be beneficiaries of prosperity in Africa. So the Young Africa Leadership Initiative that uh, the President announced in, uh, in June when he was in Africa is our effort to start addressing uh, the youth bulge and helping uh, develop the capacity of youth to take on leadership roles in the future, whether it's in politics, uh, uh, the private sector, academics. Uh, we're hoping over the next few months to start the recruitment process for a leadership forum for uh, uh, young African leaders that will take place next summer in the United States. Uh, they will spend about three months here where uh, they will get uh, have courses on, on leadership. And then we hope they go back and they use what uh, they have learned to help uh, build, the, uh, uh, build on the prosperity that is uh, possible in the countries that they're from. And then on top of that, we hope that they develop relationships across borders uh, so that uh, when there's conflict, uh, they're able to talk to each other because they know each other. Right, we'll move along to another watch party in the Republic of Congo. They ask, uh, they state, in 2008, when President Obama visited Africa, he spoke on the importance of strong institutions, not strong men. What is the U.S. doing to help African countries build strong institutions? Uh, that's a great question, and I'll use the example of, of Liberia, where you know I know uh, better than any country. I served there for uh, almost four years, and we work very, very closely with that government to help rebuild their institutions after more than 15 years of conflict. And this is a policy that we have across Africa. So we are working in ministries of health, we're working in ministries of education, we're working with uh, the justice sector, with the Minister of, uh, of Justice to build uh, uh, the institution of justice, we're working with court systems. So this is an important uh, contribution that we are making to help countries move forward in the future. Power Africa is a, uh, an amazing uh, example where we will be working with institutions in that country to build not only the regulations that allow uh, for, for power to, to be developed in Africa, but also working with the private sector to help build up uh, initiatives that will allow us to bring electricity across the continent. Next question comes from Bell Africa Media Belgium. It asks, what do you think about the rape of women in Congo and in general, and what are your plans? Uh, what do I think about the, I, I, th I think it's horrible. Uh, I think women, in, whether it's in Congo or any place in the world, women uh, are victim, more victims of, of violence and, and conflict uh, than any other population. And we uh, have worked very, very closely with uh, the UN, with NGOs, using funding from uh, USAID, from our Office of Population, Refugees and Migration, uh, to deal with victim women who are victims of violence. Uh, it is uh, something that we all have to address. Uh, and we also have to work to hold those accountable who are involved in, uh, in raping women uh, in conflict. And in several cases in DRC, uh, some have been held accountable, but I think more needs to be done. Uh, we all have to add our voices of horror uh, 
uh, to the attacks that have taken place on women across, across the world, not just in Africa. Going back to the watch party in, uh, in, on our, in the U.S. Embassy in Ghana, I have a question. U.S. President pledged $7 billion to help combat frequent power blackouts in sub-Saharan Africa. Has Power Africa already begun, and how was the selection done? Uh, Power Africa has begun in the sense that the initiative is moving forward. We are working with uh, private companies as well. Uh, six countries were selected. I think they are just a start uh, for what we would want to do. USAID is leading uh, the initiative on, on Power Africa. Uh, we're working again uh, with our energy office in, in the State Department as well, in our economic office, and we're hoping and, and, uh, that we can work with institutions on the continent of Africa to develop this initiative. I think this is going to be an initiative that will have a widespread impact because with power, companies are able to invest. Uh, with power, uh, children are able to go to school. With power, uh, health uh, and hospitals are able to function. So this is major for, for Africa. And while we will, it will take some years for uh, the results to, to be felt, it's going to take a lot of work. And we are, we've started. Elias Grevalasalasi uh, from the News Business Ethiopia, who's coming to us from the watch party in Addis Ababa, asks, what do you have to say about, say to the charge, that the U.S.'s new focus on the African continent is countering the influence of emerging economies like China? Uh, that's a great question. I get asked that question everywhere in, in Africa. And my answer to that question is, we're not competing with China in Africa. The U.S. Uh, has core values that promote the development of Africa, and we have been in Africa since the beginning. Uh, and so our efforts are not in competition with, Africa, uh, with China. Our efforts are in support of the desires of African people. And the needs in Africa are great. So I think uh, African countries can work with the Chinese to uh, work to get uh, what is in their best interest but uh, they should not see it in their interest, uh, a competition between the United States and Africa, because that doesn't exist. Haguma Christie asks a pretty broad question. She says, do you have some programs in trade and investments in Africa, and how exactly do they work? Uh, well, let me just talk about AGOA, uh, the Africa Growth and Opportunity uh, Act uh, initiative. Uh, Ethiopia hosted uh, a very, very successful AGOA forum. Uh, uh, a few few months ago, uh, and uh, more than uh, 100 uh, representatives from the U.S. government participated in that. AGOA provides an opportunity for African countries to bring uh, tariff-free trade into the United States, and I think the figure is around $34 million, uh, $34 billion in, in trade uh, in, in the past year. And we're hoping to continue with, uh, with efforts like AGOA. Uh, we have a very strong uh, investment uh, initiative that is being supported by our U.S. Trade uh, Representative's office, and we work very, very closely with businesses that are interested in investing in, in Africa. So we have a lot going on on the investment side, and uh, I think those of you who are on the continent right now probably see evidence of that. Going back to the watch party in Ghana, Isaac Adu asks, uh, with Ghana's present economic challenges, donor countries have expressed concerns about government's reckless spending. What is the U.S.'s concern going forward, and are you going to still offer support? Uh, we are very supportive of uh, the people of Ghana and the government of Ghana as the government moves forward. Uh, we're working to help countries have more transparent budgets. We're working uh, with countries to help them uh, deal with, uh, with issues of spending. I don't have the exact information that you're referring to on, on Ghana right now, but I can tell you that we will continue to uh, work with Ghana to address uh, their requirements, and we will continue to support the uh, government's movement to uh, help the investment climate so that there are more businesses uh, coming to Ghana, creating more jobs, and hopefully uh, uh, creating more opportunities. Uh, from our watch party in Zambia, Stuart Lisulo at, from The Post asks, 
Uh, does the United Nations take, uh, take seriously President Sata and other African leaders call for more representation in the UN Security Council? Uh, that's an interesting question because yes, I think the United States, uh, the United Nations does take that seriously. Uh, and I know that there are efforts uh, of uh, reform that are and discussions about reform that are, are taking place. Uh, African countries are members of, uh, of the uh, uh, General Assembly and they need to make their views known uh, as, as we move forward and have those discussions. Going back to the watch party in Addis Ababa, uh, Burhanu Fekade, the reporter from uh, the newspaper in Addis Ababa, asks, the recent attack in Kenya by the Al-Shabaab and the attack in Nigeria by Boko Haram are taking place in Africa while the U.S. and allies are watching it happen. Could something have been done to stop these events prior to their happening? My answer to that question is simple. If something could have been done to stop those events, it would have been done. Uh, we in the United States have been victims of terrorist acts in the United States. We're working very, very closely with the security services, both in Nigeria and Kenya and across Africa, in Mali, uh, for, for example, to address uh, terrorism, uh, to work to thwart terrorist efforts, to uh, attack countries. And I think many terrorist acts that might have happened have, have been stopped. Uh, so if we can stop terrorism, we, we will do it and we're putting a lot of uh, energy, a lot of effort, and a lot of resources on the continent of Africa and elsewhere uh, to stop these, uh, these horrible acts that lead to the deaths of many civilians, innocent uh, civilians, uh, such as those who died in Westgate Mall. Staying at uh, the U.S. Embassy in Addis Ababa, Elias M. Esret from the Associated Press and Afro FM Radio asks, the new U.S. Ambassador to Ethiopia Patricia Haslock has set out uh, that one of her priority uh, will be promoting the rights of the LGBT community, which is mostly uh, unapproved by both the government and the society. Does her stance show a change in policy by the government towards the African continent in general and in Ethiopia in particular on that issue? Uh, this is a U.S. government policy. It is a U.S. government value that we believe in human rights for all people uh, despite uh, any uh, laws that might exist that uh, would deny people their human rights. Uh, we strongly believe in the rights of people to choose uh, their, uh, their partners, to choose the person, as President uh, Obama has said, to choose the person they want to love and not have uh, laws that deny them those rights. So our ambassador in Ethiopia is following the policies of the U.S. government. It's a broad policy. It's not a change. Uh, it, it is a policy that reflects our values in, uh, across the United States. Right. Going back to the U.S. Embassy in Lusaka, uh, Stuart Lisulo, The Post, uh, when will Zambia receive the next U.S. ambassador to replace former Ambassador Storella? Uh, that's a great question. Uh, we do have an ambassador in line to come to uh, Zambia, and I hope that uh, he or she will be there soon. Okay, Jason Strasusio um, says, uh, this is Jason Strasusio from AP in Nairobi. FBI agents have been on the scene at Westgate Mall for several days now. What can you tell us about what they have discovered, particularly as it relates to any evidence that hostages were held by the attackers and may have died inside? Also, is there any progress being made on how many were from uh, these and who these attackers were? Uh, I can't answer those specific questions. We do have FBI agents there assisting the Kenyan security authorities in investigating uh, what took place in Westgate Mall. They're providing forensic support. They're providing other investigative support. And the results of are that their efforts are being uh, shared uh, with the government of Kenya. I, I don't have access to that information, nor do I think it would be appropriate to share it with you here. But I just want to confirm that we're there to help the government of Kenya, to help the people of Kenya determine uh, what exactly happened there uh, so that uh, we can find those who were involved and also prevent this from happening in the future. 
Georgia Tume, the Nigeria Standard Newspaper.com, he asks, does the U.S. government think the African Union and um, ECOWAS, ECOWAS leadership, leaders are doing enough to abate the spread of terrorism through various leadership virtues or defects of African leaders in the African continent? Um, we have a very strong partnership with the AU and with ECOWAS uh, to deal with terrorism and other security uh, incidents uh, throughout the continent. Uh, the AU has uh, been a strong partner uh, in Somalia, uh, in um, Mali, uh, in uh, other countries in Africa. ECOWAS uh, has been uh, uh, amazingly uh, supportive in Mali. Uh, ECOWAS was uh, uh, very much involved in the situation in Liberia. So we think that both of those organizations have been uh, strong partners and have had uh, a tremendous impact on providing a, a security for Africa. There's a lot more work to be done, but uh, we continue to support their efforts through, through training uh, and providing uh, equipment and support so that African troops can be deployed uh, throughout the continent. Alita yep. Nalo, Capital Radio Malawi, asks, America has increased its military visibility in Africa. And this is leading to speculation that it intends to establish its U.S. Africa Command military base, whose current headquarters are in Stuttgart, Germany. How true is this? Uh, we have always had a military uh, presence in our embassies, and we work closely with African militaries across the continent. AFRICOM is in Stuttgart, and as far as I know, AFRICOM will remain in Stuttgart. There are no plans uh, at this time that I'm aware of that would move uh, AFRICOM to, to the continent of Africa. That said, we will continue to develop our military-to-military -military relationships with African countries and continue to help build the capacity of African militaries to address security issues across the continent. We will continue to work on uh, training uh, African uh, troops so that they can participate in peacekeeping operations. And all of this is being done by our military uh, with uh, uh, AFRICOM's uh, uh, involvement. But as far as I know, they will continue to operate out of, uh, out of Stuttgart, Germany. Our next question comes from the watch party at the U.S. Embassy in Brazzaville. Uh, regarding the Central African Republic, it seems as though the United States is absent. What is the United States doing to support a peaceful future in the CAR? Uh, we're not absent. Uh, we have been very, very actively uh, involved with, uh, with the neighbors and with our partners to address uh, the very uh, worrisome situation in, in CAR. Uh, we are very concerned uh, that the, the uh, conflict there has uh, turned uh, uh, this country into a place where terrorists might uh, look to uh, operate and we want to work closely with uh, the civilian government in CAR to, uh, to ensure that the Seleka rebels uh, are disarmed and that they are no longer terrorizing the population. Uh, we have a, a special advisor uh, who uh, has been uh, in the region, has been uh, involved in actively in the discussions, and we're working very, very closely with the AU to support uh, efforts to build up an African force there. Uh, we participated in meetings in New York. I met with your Prime Minister in New York as uh, we looked at ways that we can continue to be actively involved. But we are, we are actively involved. I want to make sure that that's understood. From the U.S. Embassy Watch Party in Ghana, from Sandra Manu, a student at the Ghana Institute of Journalism, asks, how is the U.S. combating racism against African, uh, living, Africans living in the U.S. and other Western countries in relation to access to equal opportunities or any policies? Well, that's a good question. I think we have strong laws in the United States that provides uh, equal rights to all citizens, uh, whether it's uh, 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 based, discrimination based on race, uh, sexual orientation, uh, region. I think uh, it goes without saying that those laws are on the books. We are, and, and we address any uh, complaints in our court system. 
So I don't think that there is uh, an issue that the U.S. government is, uh, is, is not supportive of uh, populations that are different. We are a country that is extraordinarily diverse, uh, and we see diversity as a strength. And we have seen many uh, individuals who have come from Africa, who are now American citizens, who are contributing to the growth of our country, but also contributing uh, back to their countries of, of origin. And uh, this is something that we support as a government, and it is something that uh, we're proud of as, as a government. So if individuals are ex experiencing discrimination, there's a way to address that in, in our legal system. Hey, we've got time for about two more questions. We're going to take the next one from the U.S. Embassy in Brazzaville, from Erica Gogiot, uh, the Terra Africa newspaper. Will the Republic of Congo expect you to visit and meet President Denis Sassou Nguesso? Uh, I am sure that uh, the Republic of Congo will expect me to visit, and I think all countries in Africa will expect me to visit, and I will do my best. Uh, to, to do that. It might take some time. Remember how many countries there are in Africa. Uh, but as the Assistant Secretary, I represent uh, the President and the Secretary uh, to every country in Africa. We have ambassadors that are there to represent our interests. Uh, and as the Assistant Secretary, I would like to uh, uh, at least once visit every single country in Africa. So if the Republic of Congo is expecting me to, to visit, I encourage them in their expectations. I can't say when it's going to happen, but I can say that I plan to, to make that trip. And our final question will come from the U.S. Embassy in Addis Ababa from, uh, from the Watch Party. Burhanu Fikande at, from the Reporter newspaper asks, will AGOA extend for 15 years ahead? Uh, that's a good question. I can't say that AGOA will extend for 15 years, but I think I can say categorically that we are working on the extension of AGOA, and I'm confident that we will get uh, an extension. How long that extension will be will uh, be determined by, by our Congress. And, uh, and again, I, we, we just know it will be extended. So I think you can feel confidence about that, and uh, we'll see how it goes over, over the next, uh, next few months. Well, that looks like that's all the time that we have for questions. Uh, first of all, we'd like to thank you, Assistant Secretary uh, Thomas Greenfield, for joining us today and taking the time to, ask, to answer all these questions. Um, for our participants, uh, we'd like to let you know that we're going to send audio and video files to you as soon, and also a transcript um, as soon as we can after this program is over, so you can go ahead and file your stories. Uh, and again, we'd like to remind you that you can follow us uh, on Twitter, at State Dep. You can follow the U.S. Department of State, but you can also follow the Bureau of African Affairs, at Africa State. Uh, thank you so much for your time, and we hope that you'll join us again at our next program soon uh, for another program of Live at State.